Hello. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, thanks for attending my presentation. Uh, today, I will share about the expanding data analysis tool at scale with Zeppelin. Uh, my name is Jong Yeol Lee, and I'm a software engineer at Line, and I work for the data chain project, which is for constructing data pipeline from <coughs> developing ingestion system to providing analysis framework. And the another purpose of this project is to unify all, rela <coughs> all data related product and framework into one place. I will introduce today what we are working for in more detail in this talk. And <clears throat> on open source area, I'm a committer and a PMC member of Apache Zeppelin from 2015, and also an uh, open source contributor, including Spark and Yan. Yeah, uh, in this presentation, I will talk about brief introduction on my company and team, what kind of data my team handles at line, and whole data structure of <clears throat> data ingestion system from data definition to the actual stories. And I also share a trial and errors in order to speed up a specific queries. <clears throat> At last, I will show how we use Zeppelin and its settings with very simple demos if it's possible. <clears throat> yeah, to clarify it, uh, it's a bit different from my original abstraction. Uh, when I submit an abstraction of my talk, I thought I would share about Zeppelin's use setting and its usage only, because Zeppelin had a plan to release 0 0.8, and it's very astonishing improvement on features. But preparing this talk, I decided to share a whole data pipeline and infrastructures as it's more useful and helpful in the real world, uh, especially for the data engineer like me. <clears throat> yeah, uh, before we start, introducing my company will help you understand more about the rest of my talk. Line is a messaging company focused on the Asian market. Uh, it just started from the Japan from 2011. For now, we had 165 million active users in Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, and Indonesia. And users send 25 billion messages per day. And in a peak time, 420,000 messages are handled in the line's messaging server every second. It also has <coughs> several family apps like news, music, and live, uh, which is kind of a streaming service, and games. Recently, as far as I know, some financial apps like payment or private banking were added to the Lion's family app. Yes, uh, data at Line. We are using Kafka as an intermediate storage and queue. This Kafka cluster consists of 50 machines for now and handles more than 100 of topics in production, including messaging server log, which is one of the biggest log in my company. And the number of topic size is increasing every week with new type of log by new services and existing services. About the size of messages, the total size of messages is 1.4 million messages per second in average, and it's the same as 100 billion messages per day. And at the peak time, only one type of single log comes in around 1.5 million per second. Uh, in an aspect of the bandwidth, at the peak time, we generally use almost 10 gigabit network fully for data ingestion and storing them only. So we have to have two different approaches to managing them in size of data and the types of data at the same time. So <clears throat> this is a simple version of whole, whole structure of our data ingestion system. Uh, yellow line indicates the data flow. Data is created from apps and servers and which send data to the Kafka cluster. Sync components pull data from the Kafka cluster, find the timestamp and partition the data and send them to the Elasticsearch and HDFS at the same time. 
Thus, user can see those logs from Kibana for short time data, typically recent 14 days. And in case of small data, someone queries to the Elasticsearch directly for making BI and reports. In an HF, HDFS site, we provide Hive and <coughs> Hive and Spark for BI and data analysis. User can use them by CI, CLI and the Zeppelin for now. And we have a plan to remove all kind of CLI-like access because it has a potential security issues and yeah, security issue, security problem. And orange dot line means the flow of the metadata. Uh, <clears throat> sync component leads the data definition to get the timestamp fulfilled and reads the table definition to decide the location of the storage. And Hive and Spark also needs the same data to read data definition in order to get whole schema from the protocol buff stored in the HDFS. Actually, the main purpose of this system is to handle various types of data and to reduce human defaults and errors while processing them. We are still trying to automate whole processes. Uh, <clears throat> Our data ingestion starts from defining data called by data chain protocol, and which is defined by the actual data producer, not by us. For example, server developers. This definition is based on the protocol buffer tree because it supports JSON string. Yeah, that's the main reason. So we can also support protocol buffer bytes and the JSON string as well. In, in, in other words, in case that service don't have protocol buffer stuff, they can use JSON string instead. Representatively, node application use the JSON string to produce data to our cluster. Concerning the structure of the data, basically, we don't care actual data structures, and we don't have to take care of it, but we enforce just only one field named timestamp with a special purpose. By setting timestamp value as a field name, we use that field value as a key of the partitioning data. In case of retrieving data from the HDFS, data schema built automatically by the protocol buffer deserializer, which is a custom implementation to get schema from the protocol buffer definition descriptors. The definition descriptor would be saved when building protocol buffer stuff at the first time with the protocol buff uh, options, as far as I know. So our Hive Metastore doesn't have any specific information about field, rather than it just had the protocol buff definition name only. And this type of Metastore definition is also used by the Spark SQL in order to retrieve a schema in a same way. Uh, Oh, I will show you this one. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's too slow because this server is located in the Japan for now <laughs> in my in my rear cluster of my company. So this is our Hive Metastore format. Just only table name and just partitioning information and just third. Uh, third is always the same, protocol of the serializer, and third property is just only the name of the protocol of the definition. So when user, when user query from the Hive or Spark, the whole schema is generated at the running time, so if you change it to the, your schema for later, you can just update to your protocol for name, names, and our system builds the newer version of JAR and deploy into the Hive Server 2 and restart Hive Server 2 then. So user don't, want, don't have to add some extra jobs for the newer, newer using the newer schemas. 
and it's as same as the uh, Spark. So, but it's a bit different Hive and Spark because Spark don't use the original Hive Hive, <coughs> Hive Meta Store. Okay, back to. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, fine. Uh, pardon? Uh, last night? Oh, yeah, this is, uh, we, we also have a, a batch job for adding the Hive partition, so Hive partition. <clears throat> our batch job reads this information, so add, add, uh, decides to add a new partition or keep the partition and uh, prolong the next time. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, back to. And this kind of method help us to avoid manual configuration on Hive Meta Store by every new and changing schema. And in case of the user aspect, user don't have to wait for the infra to be prepared as well. Yes, the next part is table definition. Table definition is much simpler than the, da than the data definition. As you saw it, uh, it's just very, s it, as you saw it, it's, <coughs> Sorry, table definition is based on the hybrid meta store. Hybrid meta store, so it's a single YAML file which is mainly used from the sync components. It includes a database and a table name, uh, which is used in a git in a, in a Hive meta store and deciding the location of the HDFS. It also has a name of Kafka topic and schema for the table and. And the user and the, our user and <coughs> sorry, user and our team communicate with this kind of YAML file uh, to how to store the data from uh, which topics, which sorry, <coughs> which Kafka topics and store it where to the HDFS. So yeah, and. Also, sync components are actual working process. Currently, there are two types of components we have, one, cur one called sync ES and another called sync HDFS. Basically, sync component was implemented to refresh protocol and table information when restarted by downloading the latest one. We will make them also auto restartable sooner. Yes, uh, short summary of the first part, first part. In our cases, Automation is very useful to save our time and to reduce human error. Uh, we still have manual configuration parts, and uh, most of the problem occurs in these parts, especially in case when we don't execute some script or we don't restart a component within a proper time. And custom search is also useful to avoid manual configuration on Hive Meta Store and to avoid converting processing when storing data. In my past experience, converting data was too complicated because we had to understand business logic as well. And as you know, business logic has been changing a lot, so I don't want to follow them at all. Yes, next. Uh, all of our analysis framework runs on top of the YAN cluster. Uh, we considered dividing some resources like YAN Federation or node labeling, but concluded it's not that useful for now because it didn't solve our problem. One of our most annoying problem was one job occupied full of, full, of, full of resources on the queue. At first, my team believed that user controls their resources wisely. So we enabled all users to use full of resources without any limitation, but it didn't take a long time to conclude I was wrong. 
Yeah, and I found some interesting things from users that they didn't see the YAN resource page at all. Moreover, the most of users didn't recognize they were using full of resources. In fact, they just didn't want to think of resources at all. They didn't care how much resources they took when they submit their job. So we decided to manage Q, Q, uh, we decided to manage queues for user group and service group and user limitation or service limitations. It's quite handy, but it works well for now. So yeah, actually still simple, but our queue is only for stream and default for the ad hoc job and batch for the service. Every service has its own batch queue, so new services comes in, uh, we assign a new queues for that services as well. <clears throat> yeah, we provide typical frameworks to developer and analysis. Hive is a traditional framework to get KPI and statistics. And we also have several hundred of existing Hive jobs using Hive. Uh, fortunately, nowadays, some users want to create a new BI job with the Spark SQL or Spark Streaming, so I hope all jobs move to the Spark jobs. Uh, in case of Spark, some users use, use it for the EDA and BI, and recently some of the teams tried to make a streaming application with Spark Streaming and Kafka. Okay, now next I will, show, I will share my trial and errors to optimize the query. <clears throat> yeah, I got a request from the another team recently. The requirement quite requirement was quite simple. They wanted to get a specific user's behavior for 90 days within 10 minutes using our resources. But the problem, what problem is the data size. Uh, the size of the data is six terabyte per day. It means 540 terabytes for 90 days. And we only have 500 machines of cluster. So <clears throat> before Optimizing, um, I execute this query in order to check the current status. The test, date, test data size for one hour, just, just one hour, hour 14, was 300 gigabytes, and the chunk size of our cluster is 256 megabytes. It took for two, two minutes for, it took two minutes and Spark executed 1535 task to finish it. Uh, increasing this result to the 90 days, we need to 72 hours in the same environment. Even if we would use full of resources, we would still have several hours to get it. It took too long and it has too many tasks, I think. My first approach was to convert data to as, as a parquet format, simply. It's known as that parquet format is much faster than the low data format in case we filter something. About hourly data, converting data to parquet format took around two minutes and I thought it was reasonable because one hour, two, two minutes. And query it again. But it's still one and a half minutes and it's not that fast, just so uh, executed one, it executed 1535 task because this query still leaves all of the data. I had to find another solution to solve it. So I tried to solve this data in order to make one user's behavior stored in one and same files. As far as I know, when reading parquet file, it can be skipped if it has no filters value. Processing this script took 80 minutes because of the shuffling data, but it's still okay. And even the file count was decreased to the number of shuffle partition. By default, uh, 200, 200 files was created in the HDFS per hour. And then query it again. Mm. 
It still took one and a half minutes, and even Spark executed almost the same number of tasks because Spark created tasks per chunk each and read all of the data still. At that time, I concluded I should reduce the number of tasks to reduce the whole processing time. So, so my next, next approach is to use the bucket by. Yeah, it was a terrible mistake, but anyway, because I have read bucket by reduce the number of tasks in, in a document. A document says bucket by reduce your number of tasks. So it's not always true. <laughs> but <clears throat> while processing this script, I was surprised due to the number of files. The script took around 70 minutes, but script created 153,500 files. It's mainly because this script has no shuffling stage, so every mapper task creates the number of buckets file. Even worse, it would create the same number of files every hour if we adopt this. So it's not acceptable for our, for our cases. And even querying it, it occurs a stack overflow error, but I decided not to dig into it because we couldn't use this kind of bucketing method as well. Then I tried to reduce the number of the number of buckets and uh, sort the original data. It took around 90 minutes and created 2,000 files only. 2,000 means the number of shuffle, <coughs> shuffle size times the number of buckets. So I think it could be a solution because the file size, file, number of files is acceptable. But it also fails, yeah because it took one hour, more than one hour to get the results. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but in case where we are using bucketing, uh, Spark might launch on a few number of executors with bucketing size of task. Even worse, only one or two, in my cases, one or two tasks read all, try to read all of data from the HDFS. So it looked like a complicated bug, and I have no time, so I decided to find another solution. Yeah, uh, the final approach looks like it. Uh, I made a custom hash group by myself. As far as I know, Spark already has supported directory-based pruning method. But in our cases, we cannot use partition by for UID directly because there are almost three million UID in this service. So I decided to make this kind of hash group. Just hashing and divide by number and the <coughs> gathering, gathering by the remain. This script created a new level of partition named hash UID, uh, the yellow one, and stored the data by this criteria. It still made 100 53,500 files, but I'd like to test it in order to check if it reduced the number of tasks by pruning. Yeah, to take an advantage of this, I should add a new filter to find a specific hash group. But it took only 30, 30 seconds or less to get a specific user's behavior with one hour. And it executed only 70, uh, it executed 70 tasks only. Now, I have to solve the huge number of files. I added repartition methods to reduce the number of files. It's a very simple approach. But it took more than one hour to partition whole data. But it creates only 1,000 files. And create it. Uh, this approach has meaning to reduce total number of tasks. Uh, it, the Spark executed only 30 <coughs> tasks. Now, um, I think I need to find an appropriate number of repartition or the hash group, number of hash group, hash group uh, through some experimenter. Yeah. Some of this 
trial and error. Uh, I understood Spark SQL more. And columnar format is generally good. And bucketing is also known as a good method when joining tables. But it's not always fast. So you should understand what you query. And you can use another skill like predicate pushdown to optimize the storage level. Yes. Mm. Zeppelin. The last part is about Zeppelin. Uh, recently, Zeppelin has prepared for the 0.8 release for a while. As far as I know, we made RC5, but it's still in progress. Anyway, there are many improvements. In this talk, uh, I will show you only three issues, and you can see a whole list of improvements in the following link. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And the first. Zeppelin has a brand new Spark interpreter now and supports YAN cluster mode officially. The second, Lifecycle Manager was introduced and Timeout Lifecycle Manager is the first implementation to handle life, interpreter's lifecycle. Finally, Zeppelin also started to support JMX feature as well. Spark interpreter. Uh, you can use Spark in YAN cluster mode, and it works well. Yeah, uh, actually, my team used the YAN cluster mode in our clusters, and it also supports on user impersonation by proxy user features. So, to use them, to use impersonation, you need to set proxy user setting in your core site XML for the Zeppelin users and res restart all of YAN resources. YAN resource managers. Yeah, and I will show you this. Oh. Oops. Yeah, actually, we are using LDAP for authenticating users, and the LP11 blah 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 is my LDAP ID of my company. So, <clears throat> and interpreter page. Yeah, S cluster is our Spark interpreter name. So this is this is set for per user isolated isolated mode and also enable the user impersonated. And so if you run Yes, so if you execute any of Spark related paragraph and you will see like this. This is a uh, my user ID, impersonated user ID by Zeppelin and this is a Zeppelin Spark interpreter. And you can also see the Spark UI, you can check if the master value is YAN cluster as well. Yeah, and okay, and the next lifecycle manager. At the beginning, Zeppelin was designed to keep user session because in a single user environment, most users don't want to lose his or her session to continue their analysis even after for a long time. But in a multi-user environment, we need to manage the whole resources. So killing idle interpreters will affect positively for all users. To use timeout lifecycle manager, you need to set those three settings, lifecycle manager classes and intervals and thresholds. Those are our currently current settings. Uh, it means if a user session become idle for three minutes, uh, the, that interpreter will be shut down. You can also check. You can also see this option. You can you can also set this option in the Zeppelin site XML in the conf directory, and you can see the configuration on 
this. Like this. Yeah, just just setting this just setting this value, lifecycle manager works for your job plan. <coughs> yes, the final feature is JMX. JMX is actually used for the most of the JVM based application and metric <coughs> metric services gather them to show the time series information as far as I know. So far Zeppelin don't have it because Zeppelin is not a kind of memory-based application. And the most, most of Zeppelin's problem were related to the interpreter side, for instance, zombie interpreters. Both in case where multi-user user, <coughs> but <coughs> in case where multi-user user a single Zeppelin instance, no one could figure out how many users are currently connecting to the Zeppelin and how many interpreters are running uh, in the Zeppelin server now. So I added to get both of information at any time. Uh, you can connect to the Zeppelin via JMX application like JConsole now and check those information. <coughs> uh, I'll try, I, I didn't try this computer yet. Oh, this computer doesn't have JDK, so <laughs> I didn't execute uh, JConsole. But you can, but <clears throat> you can you can see you can see the JMX console when when you upgrade your Zeppelin to 0 0.8. Yeah, bad thing. Uh, but some parts remain as bad, unfortunately. Zeppelin still cannot handle the zombie process issue completely. If interpreters become hanging in the repeatedly full GC status, uh, we cannot even restart that interpreter because too close interpreter in current structures, we should connect that interpreter, but it's impossible in this uh, repeatedly fu full GC status. And the second one is, except the Spark interpreter, all other interpreters are still launched in the same machine. For, for instance, Python and JDBC. So I hope we improve them in the next release. Yeah, uh, key takeaways. Uh, automation is uh, mandatory to handle various types of data. Without automation, you won't spend your time in developing infrastructure itself because you always have to operate a cluster only and meeting and discussing for new types of data for the resource of, <coughs> resource of his or their job. Uh, in my experience, users don't want their job to be in a queue, in, especially in the YAN resource manager, in YAN resources. They want to start their job immediately when they submit it, even though it finishes very slowly. And third one, sometimes optimizing stories can be better than optimizing queries. Finally, Zeppelin become better than before, and 0 0.8 is really good, and you can try it. Yeah, this is my last slide. Hiring. My team is based on the Japan and the South Korea. Yeah, we are handling tremendous data in the real world. Uh, please feel free to check this link. Uh, this is a Japanese, but we have a Chrome. <laughs> yeah, and please check it. And you can also find me easily in the Japan mailing list and send me an email if you have any question about my team and company. And thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, any question? Yeah, okay. I yeah. Did you try any other compression techniques 
Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, okay. Uh, your question is about the compression compression codex for the parquet format, yeah. As far as I know, gzip is relatively faster than the snappy, uh, but I didn't try it yet, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, your question was how to install the newer Zeppelin in the HTTP environment, right? Yeah. Yes, I yeah, yes, I know. Uh, so actually, I asked asked to uh, Hortner Sky to install the newer version of Zeppelin, but they answered me there is no way <laughs> for now. So I replaced the jar files to the Zeppelin directory in the in, installed in the Zeppelin <coughs> Zeppelin machine. So just research from the Ambari and setting all, all all you can all you can set all kind of settings in the Ambari and just restart button and just read new version of jar and launch in a new version of Zeppelin. Yeah actually they <coughs> they suggested that way to upgrade the Zeppelin manually. Uh, as, far as, as far as I know, it's not possible on, from the web. Just you just only accessing to the CLI and just replace the jar manually. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.